that historic visit. First tonight on our news, live at 7. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris meeting with Caribbean leaders in the Bahamas today. She's the highest ranking U.S. official to visit the country since independence. I'm Jamila Mizik with more on the historic visit straight ahead on our news. And an American visitor nursing serious injuries tonight following another shark attack in Bahamian waters. We've got the latest on her condition straight ahead. Plus, Bahamians abroad reacting tonight as wildfires send blankets of smoke across Canadian and American cities. And then in our news at 7.30, we'll have the latest on those bilateral talks with regional leaders as U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris heads home. Our news live at 7 starts right now. Welcome to our news live at 7. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Kendino Knowles. It's an historic day for the country as United States Vice President Kamala Harris arrived in New Providence early this afternoon. The USA's second in command meeting with Caribbean leaders at Atlantis Resort with climate change and Haiti top on the agenda. Ahead of those meetings, she was welcomed by high ranking members of the Davis administration and other special guests. Our Jamila Mizek was there. Just before 12.30 p.m. today, a U.S. Air Force jet carrying United States Vice President Kamala Harris landed at Odyssey Aviation. The special occasion marks the first time a sitting U.S. Vice President has visited the Bahamas. The 49th U.S. VP also traveling to the Bahamas during Caribbean American Heritage Month. Shortly after landing, Harris made her way onto the tarmac, greeted by U.S. Chargé d'Affaires Usha Pitts and Foreign Affairs Minister Fred Mitchell along along with other government officials. She then performed an inspection of the Guard of Bahamian Armed Forces. Vice President Harris also meeting with a number of adoring individuals ahead of her high-level meeting at the Atlantis Resort. Students Kaya Ramsey, Shanario Grant, and Shania Higgs were among the group who got to see the Vice President. The students say the experience of being up close and personal with such a powerful world leader is one they'll never forget. To say the least, it was a very enlightening experience, you know, to be less than five feet away from such a powerful woman and a black woman at that. It was really great and definitely a life-lasting memory. I'm, I know that seeing someone like her and at her rank is, that's that's an experience that I think all being and children should experience. And for me, that was a once-in-a-lifetime thing. I expected to be more um, from a sideline, but we actually got to see her and we got to wave at her and it felt like personal. Vice President Harris, a proud member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, was also greeted by some of her Bahamian sorority sisters. It's an amazing opportunity to have Vice President Kamala Harris come to the Bahamas. And we were delighted to have her here because it's an extension of us. Now this visit is historic as Vice President Harris is the highest ranking U.S. official to visit the Bahamas since its independence in 1973. And as the Bahamas celebrates this year 50 years of independence, it also marks 50 years of diplomatic relations between both countries. Reporting for our news, I'm Jamila Misse. All right. Thanks so much, Jamila. Definitely personal for us. Well, getting ready for the U.S. Vice President's visit was no easy feat. We're being told that it took weeks of preparation. U.S. Embassy Acting Consular Chief Jessica Elsmer telling us a lot went into making sure everything was ready. This has been weeks in the making, uh, lots of intense diplomatic negotiations, trying to get everything just right. Um, as we're, you know, celebrating our 50 years of diplomatic relations here, celebrating your 50 years of independence. So we knew we had to go big, uh, and we are just so excited to have her here. Um, you know, and of course, this is Caribbean American Heritage Month. So what an excellent way to kick that off as well. Over the past five decades, the Bahamas and the United States have forged commercial and trade ties, have cooperated on security and law enforcement, and shared cultural and educational exchanges. The acting consular chief says the VP's visit is to strengthen those ties. We knew we needed someone uh, of her caliber to come and emphasize the ties and the value in our relationships here in the Caribbean. Um, and you know, of course, she's got her AKA sisters here. She's got strong ties, so we were just excited that we could bring her back. We could bring her here for the first time. 
All right, and we'll have more from today's bilateral meetings, which was expected to wrap up moments ago. Be sure and stay tuned to our news at 7.30. Now to a 73-year-old American woman who is the latest visitor bitten by a shark in Bahamian waters. The attack happening in water south of Taino Beach in Grand Bahama. Police telling our news the incident happened just after 1 o'clock yesterday afternoon when the Marshalltown, Iowa resident was on the stern ladder of a 32-foot island hopper vessel. That's when they say the shark bit her left calf. She had just wrapped up a group snorkeling tour in an area called Shark Junction. The victim was taken to the Rand Hospital where her injuries are listed as serious. Two weeks ago, a baby shark bit an American man while he was fishing in waters near West End. He was bitten on his right hand after catching a baby shark and trying to remove a fish hook from its mouth. A veteran corrections officer convicted of smuggling drugs into the prison has abandoned his appeal. Herman Major, who worked at the Department of Corrections for 39 years, was convicted of possession of dangerous drugs with intent to supply and taking prohibited items into the correctional facility following a trial before Magistrate Samuel McKinney. Major was fined $5,000 on the drug charge with a default sentence of nine months. He was fined $2,500 for taking prohibited items into the prison and will serve six months in prison if he doesn't pay the fine. According to the prosecution, Major brought a pair of Nike Air Max tennis shoes to the prison for an inmate maximum security to the property intake area. Another officer cut the soles of the shoes open after noticing the stitching was non-factory. That's when the officer found a total of five ounces of marijuana hidden inside the shoes. All right, we've got much more to get to, including reaction from Bahamians abroad impacted by blankets of smoke caused by wildfires. We'll get to that in a moment, but we check in now with meteorologist Greg Thompson. Greg? Yeah, thanks, Kenina. Happy Thursday evening, everybody. Yeah, we're still tracking a lot of moisture that's moving across the area. We have a little bit of a break. We'll share that in our satellite picture. So we saw some sun earlier today. Showers now outside our studios under partly cloudy skies. Your temperature is at 83 degrees. Your winds are out of the south at 30 miles per hour. A little bit on the breezy side, and your feels like temperature is at 83. Temperatures around the islands right now. Freeport, 83. Also in Marsh Harbor, 83 there. A pair of 84s in Alistair, Bimini, and Great Harbor Key. 83s again in Nicholstown, Andrew and over in Governor's Harbor. Into the Central Bahamas, we pick up 84 in Kemp's Bay, 82 in Arthurstown, Cat Island, and 77 in Cubantown, San Salvador. Georgetown, 83, 81. You guys are having some showers and some isolated thunderstorms across the Central Bahamas. Southeast Bahamas, 82 in Duncan Town, Ragged Island, and in Colonel Hill, Cricket Island. Delectable Bay, Acklands, 83. 85 in Abrams Bay, and in Turks and Caicos Islands, Providentialis. Matthew Town, Inagui, you are the warm spot, rounding out our temperature profile at 80. Satellite view, mix of sun and clouds across the northwest Bahamas, but that moisture plume continues to track across us from out of the uh, southwestern Caribbean. Isolated showers and thunderstorms across Florida now spreading across the northwest Bahamas. Some of those showers are waning as we speak, but you notice we got a big patch of showers and thunderstorms across western Cuba that's headed towards Andros. We will see one or two showers later on tonight as most of this moisture plume continues to affect us throughout tomorrow. That's your first look at weather. Stick with us. Look at your extended forecast is still to come. We are just getting started in our news, but when we come back, Bahamians Abroad giving us a first-hand account of the smoke blanketing cities across Canada and the United States. And back here at home, a senior MP lobbying for an increase in the capital grant for members. And how the tides are changing in this week's Sustainability First, when our news returns. If new, Heineken Silver was a riveting Viking soccer. Your family tortured my first wife and stole my second favorite goat. Now you want to marry my daughter. Okay. <laughs> All the taste, no bitter endings. Smooth, fresh, silver. Bahamian residents abroad giving us a first-hand account of the smoke that has blanketed cities across Canada and the, and the northern United States. Our Joshua Williams is following this. 
for over a month wildfires have been burning across Canada, causing smoke to spread across the country and into parts of the northern United States. We spoke to a Bahamian student in Canada who described the surprising conditions he experienced at the beginning of his day. When I got up and I was headed to the gym and I was like, whoa, what is going on? Um, it wasn't thick. It wasn't like I couldn't breathe. I couldn't, I couldn't inhale, but it was alarming because... I haven't seen that. At first, I thought it was like maybe a building caught on fire or something like that or something in the vicinity maybe had blown up. You never know. But then I started smelling it and then I started seeing like hazes, hazes like fly past and pretty much went about my day after that. While the fire rages in Canada, it's parts of America that are feeling the brunt of the hazardous conditions. In New York particularly, millions of residents are under air quality alerts, many of which are in the unhealthy zone on the air quality index. We caught up with a Bahamian professor living in New York. It's getting into some of the buildings. A lot of people have uh, gone back to wearing masks. We work in buildings primarily, but you have to get to those buildings. A lot of people take public transportation. And so between getting on and off the train you have you know minutes to walk 10 20 minutes and we've been warned that uh, staying outside for anywhere more than a half hour to an hour can be very dangerous to your health so it's a matter of rushing from one spot to the next thompson says he's not worried about the smoke and is encouraged by the fearless spirit of new yorkers around him nothing stops the city from moving and this is just another instance of this to, to, to a new yorker this is a minor inconvenience um but it's still, people are still taking it seriously enough. Reporting for our news, I'm Joshua Williams. All right, thanks a lot, Josh. And back here at home, Foreign Affairs Minister and Member of Parliament for Fox Hill, Fred Mitchell, making the case in the House of Assembly for parliamentarians who he says need more funding to support the needs of their constituents. Mitchell says he believes inflation is the number one issue impacting Bahamians, noting he's never seen this level of demand from constituents during his 31 years in public life. One of the things I thought, therefore, would help members of parliament is to allow for the $3,500 for the office accommodation, and uh, which is now $2,500, and $100,000, which is a capital grant, to go up to $150,000. My argument is that a member of parliament ought to be able to direct that spending if he needs a capital project done within his constituency. So what you do is the allocations that would normally fall, for example, for the Ministry of Works, can be, some of that can be transferred over to the direct, the direction of the member of parliament. And by that means, be able to fix the demands that people have on members of parliament for various matters. Mitchell, who was contributing to the 2023-2024 budget debate, told parliamentarians he believes the public sees no distinction between public money and the personal money of MPs, often su suggesting parliamentarians pay for projects themselves. He says it's also important to consider the level of spending on social projects within the constituency, such as supporting local bands or schools. By the time you look around, the capital grant has disappeared. Um, and I'm saying that um, this may help in a small way to try and improve that um, situation for members of parliament. And members of parliament uh, have a, a very important job to do uh, in trying to keep the government connected to uh, the people who they govern, but also in making sure that the peace is kept uh, in their communities and also making sure that the infrastructure in their communities is up to standard and up to scratch. When our news comes back from the break, we turn our spotlight to stories making headlines across the world as the FAA lifts a ground stop for flights bound for New York's LaGuardia Airport. This is Canada adds five Caribbean countries to its partial visa waiver program. And the Labour Minister affirming the country's commitment to social justice at an international conference in Geneva. The details when our news continues. This is our news. Welcome back. We turn our attention now to stories making headlines across the world.
The Federal Aviation Administration lifting a ground stop for flights bound for New York's LaGuardia Airport due to smoke, but has delayed some flights on the ground. The FAA says flights into Philadelphia are also being impacted because of the wildfire smoke. The agency in a statement saying that it will adjust the volume of traffic to account for the rapidly changing conditions. As of 2.45 this afternoon, airlines in the U.S. have canceled 120 flights and delayed another 1,900 others. The FBI is warning consumers against using public phone charging stations in order to avoid exposing their devices to malicious software. The agency tweeting recently that public USB stations like the ones found at malls and airports are being used by bad actors to spread malware and monitoring software. It's asking people to carry their own charger and USB cord and use an electrical outlet instead. Jordan Vandersloot, who is accused of extorting money from the mother of Natalie Holloway, has landed in the United States. The Alabama teen was last seen with the Dutch National and two others 18 years ago in Aruba. He was indicted in 2010 on U.S. federal charges of extortion and wire fraud in connection with a plot to sell information about the whereabouts of Holloway's remains in exchange for $250,000. FBI agents flew with Van der Sloot on a U.S. Department of Justice plane to an airport in Birmingham, Alabama, where he landed this afternoon. And Canada has announced the addition of 13 countries to its electronic travel authorization program for eligible travelers with five Caribbean countries added to the list. Five of those countries include Argentina, St. Kitts and Nevis and St. Lucia. Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Sean Fraser making the announcement today saying travelers from these countries who have either held a Canadian visa in the last 10 years or who currently hold a valid U.S. non-immigrant visa can now apply for an ETA instead when traveling by air. And Labor Minister Keith Bell making his contribution at the 111th session of the International Labor Conference in Geneva, Switzerland. Bell telling delegates the Bahamas has begun work since last year's, last year's meeting, which aligns with the conference's goals presented in the report. Some of the which ratification include of ILO Convention 190 on the elimination of violence and harassment in the world of work and Convention 159 on vocational rehabilitation and employment of persons with disabilities. The deployment of a national apprenticeship program task force which will review the legislation and supporting policies on apprenticeship. The increase in the national minimum wage with effect from July 1st, January 1st, 2023 directing the National Tripartite Council to submit recommendations on the enactment of legislation to establish a livable wage. All around the world, people are celebrating World Oceans Day. The first World Ocean Day was held on June 8, 1992, and in December 2008, the United Nations General Assembly officially recognized the day. Marlena Leonard has more in this week's Sustainability First. Bahamas first, putting sustainability first for our people and our environment. What's first for you and the planet comes first for us. You might be asking yourself, why does World Oceans Day matter? In a country surrounded by some of the most beautiful waters in the world, it's easy to take it for granted. Still, the ocean plays a vital part in our daily lives, and its benefits are dependent on its health. Our oceans not only provide much of the food we as Bahamians live off of, that our Bahamian fishermen's livelihoods are dependent on, but it also provides vast job opportunities for those employed in the tourism and ecotourism industries. But even beyond that, in a world where climate change is creating stronger and more frequent storms, it's possible that the ocean's most important gift to us is its capacity as a carbon sink. The ocean captures 25% of all carbon dioxide emissions and 90% of the excess heat the emissions generate. The ocean is also sometimes called the lungs of the planet, as it generates 50% of the oxygen we need. But it's not the water itself that does this amazing work. It's the organisms living inside it, like coral reefs and especially seagrass, which can process carbon dioxide up to 35 times faster than rainforests. But pollution and climate change could kill these vital protectors of our planet. You can use this World Oceans Day to reflect on how you can be more environmentally conscious. Reporting for our news and reminding you to put sustainability first, I'm Marlena Leonard. Still to come in our news today in history, find out interesting facts about the day that was June 8th, including the 2013 discovery of a baby at the city dump. 
And then in our news at 7.30, more from today's U.S.-Caribbean bilateral meeting and the $100 million pledge from the United States. This as the U.K. High Commissioner in Grand Bahama this week on a fact-finding mission. The story when our news returns. Welcome back to our news. It's time now to turn our spotlight on events that shaped the day that was June 8th. Take a look. On this day in Bahamian history in 2013, the decomposing body of a baby was found among rubbish at the city dump. At the time, police superintendent Stephen Dean told reporters a heavy equipment operator was clearing a section of the dump when he smelled a strong odor. When he went to check, police say he found a plastic bag with the infant's body inside. The condition of the body made it hard for investigators to determine the baby's sex. The house, the house suspends. The house is suspends. The member for Central Grand Bahama, the member for Central Grand Bahama, the member for Kalani, the member for St. Anne's. Please leave the chambers. House suspends. That was then PLP House Speaker Kendall Major in 2015 suspending opposition FNM members from the House of Assembly. This after they tried to bar then Michael MPV Alfred Gray from delivering his contribution to the budget debate. The opposition's protest was in keeping with its promise to disrupt Gray whenever he stood to speak on the House floor. This followed a scandal in Mayaguana over his alleged interference in a magistrate's matter. A police investigation was launched, but no charges came out of the case. While the government considered Gray exonerated, the opposition would not let go of the issue. In 2020, then-Deputy Prime Minister K. Peter Turnquest defended the Minister Administration's proposed plan to borrow $1.3 billion. In the heated exchange in Parliament, Turnquest butt heads with several members of the opposition PLP. Then in 2021, former Seabreeze MP and Cabinet Minister Lanisha Roll defended her time in office, saying she took a beating and implied that she was not treated fairly, especially as a woman in Cabinet. She told Parliament that she took the blame for things as Minister of Social Social Services, as well as Minister of Youth, Sports and Culture, when really it was the government making certain decisions, leaving her to take the fall. The first thing I was told in politics was that your seniority is based on your election or appointment to political life, and there's a pecking order. Not so for the women, ma'am. We are where we are. It is what it is. Also in 2021, during the country's COVID-19 phased reopening, Royal Caribbean's Adventure of the Seas made its inaugural visit to the Bahamas. It was the first cruise ship to home port in Nassau. The ship and its fully vaccinated crew set sail from Nassau on June 12th. And finally in 2022, residents in the capital reporting several tornadoes, one of them seen here in this video. Forecasters said at the time, the tornadoes developed from severe thunderstorms in warm, moist, unstable air. This is Paradise has become the first Bahamian television series to secure a distribution deal with a major American streaming service. The series is now on Chicken Soup for the Soul Entertainment's free streaming service Crackle after premiering on May 30th this year. The six-episode series was produced and directed by award-winning Bahamian filmmaker Kareem Mortimer. With an all-Bahamian Caribbean cast and crew and production team, This is, a, this is Paradise was filmed on Eleuthera and tells the story of two women who discovered their shared heritage as half-sisters after the sudden passing of their father. The premiere of the series coincides with Caribbean Heritage Month in the United States, which is celebrated in June. 
All right, if you want to learn more about that and for all of today's top stories, be sure and visit ournews.bs. That's going to do it for us in News at 7. Joining us now is Italia Hall with the latest headlines. Italia, did you get to see uh, This is Paradise? No, I did not. Not yet? Tell so, us more about it? Did you no, I haven't seen it okay. yet. So, I mean, it's something for us to watch, yeah. right? All yeah, right, you'll and make also it a just <laughs> good to see that they are getting that kind of recognition. Yeah, right? Two for two to the world. Of course. Yeah. All right, Ken. Well, we have the latest from the U.S. Caribbean bilateral talks with the U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris and the U.K. High Commissioner in Grand Bahama. Here are your latest headlines. A $100 million pledge, first tonight on Our News Live at 7.30. The Vice President of the United States making a pledge to the Bahamas in Haiti. Our Berkeley McDermott has a full story, plus fostering a positive relationship. UK officials on the ground in Grand Bahama this week on a fact-finding mission. To try and identify the areas where we can foster this uk Bahamian cooperation at a commercial level uh, and really see what benefits we can bring to both countries. Also, hear why the Foreign Affairs Minister says there's a lingering fear on Grand Bahama following a back and forth between government and the Port Authority. And later, Royal Caribbean International is giving the public an opportunity to weigh in on his proposed beach club project. We have the details. Our news live at 7.30 starts in a moment. At Doctors Hospital, our lamp just got brighter. The Loyalty Advantage membership program now has three unique plans to choose from. From LAMP prepaid with free prime care visits and service line discounts, LAMP insured with copay waivers and zero upfront collections at the ER and inpatient services, or our new LAMP access, a free plan that offers 10% off lab, pharmacy, and imaging. LAMP has a plan for everyone. To sign up, visit our website or give us a call. Doctors Hospital, trusted and best care now. Welcome to our news and thank you for joining us. I'm Natalia Hall. An historic day for the country as United States Vice President Kamala Harris arrived in New Providence for bilateral talks with leaders from across the region. The USA's second in command met with Caribbean leaders to discuss issues included including climate change in Haiti. This as the poor island nation has been suffering from an ongoing humanitarian crisis. The vice president pledging over $100 million of support for the Caribbean with over 50 million of that set to go towards Haiti. Our Bertrand McDermott gets us started. During multilateral talks with leaders from across the region, United States Vice President Kamala Harris made a more than $100 million pledge to the Caribbean, 50 million of that set aside for Haiti, now facing ongoing economic and political instability. Today I am pleased to announce $53.7 million in new humanitarian aid for Haiti. In addition, our administration will support the extension of HOPE HELP trade preferences for Haiti, which are due for renewal in 2025. But more than the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Haiti, it's expected that Harris, who is co-hosting the meeting with Bahamian Prime Minister and CARICOM Chair Philip Davis, will also tackle a major regional concern, climate change. A $20 million investment in the Caribbean Climate Investment Program to help incentivize the private sector to partner with Caribbean nations. Harris announced an additional $15 million investment for emergency response efforts. We also learned from the VP the U.S. is looking to lead a diplomatic campaign with the World Bank for multilateral development bank reform. She explains what that will mean for the region. We seek more available and availability of low-cost concessional financing to nations in the Caribbean. New debt must include disaster clauses to allow a pause on debt payments immediately following a natural disaster. And three, we want the bank to better mobilize the private sector in support of these goals. Today's meeting follows a commitment made at the Summit of America's meeting in Los Angeles last year, making her the first highest ranking U.S. official to visit the Bahamas since its independence in 1973. And despite notable contributions, she admits there is still much work to be done. Security and prosperity of this region requires the type of collaboration and partnership that we have developed and continue 
to grow over the last two years. It is now following that briefing, the Vice President along with the Caribbean leaders were locked in an hours long discussion on issues facing the region. Reporting for our news, I'm Berthony McDermott. All right, thanks so much, Berthony. Well, more than a year after Prime Minister Philip Davis said there needs to be a crackdown on gun trafficking from the United States, Vice President Kamala Harris revealing a new position in U.S. law enforcement to address the vexing issue. Last year, Davis said more than 90% of guns confiscated and used as murder weapons in the Bahamas can be traced to American manufacturers. Today, I am pleased to announce that the United States Department of Justice will create a new position, a coordinator for Caribbean firearms prosecutions, which will help maximize information sharing between our countries to support the prosecution of traffickers. While a recently signed U.S. law makes way for this and includes new federal criminal offenses for firearms trafficking and straw purchases, Harris also revealing the establishment of a Haiti transnational investigative unit. This, she says, will facilitate the crackdown on the issues and human smuggling. And we will stand up a Haiti transnational criminal investigative unit in collaboration with the Haitian National Police to facilitate investigation and prosecution of firearms and human trafficking, which affects the entire region. The British High Commissioner to the Bahamas and Grand Bahama this week on a fact-finding mission. He's also looking to further develop the uk Bahamian relationship. I spoke with the Commissioner and his team on the sidelines of a meeting held at the Grand Bahama Chamber of Commerce. Extremely pleased to have just landed in Grand Bahama and brought with me His Majesty's Trade Commissioner Jonathan Knott and, uh, and the team from uh, the British team from Jamaica as well with Jamila Ward. And we're here, we've started our trip here very purposefully because Grand Bahama is the great prize uh, in the Bahamian economy. British High Commissioner Tom Hartley says he's pleased that a British company has made an investment in the redevelopment of the Grand Bahama International Airport. Hopefully we'll see some movement in there in the next couple of weeks. But that's the first of many things that we all know that uh, Grand Bahama promises. So whether it's light industry or whether it's tourism or, or whatever is the great next adventure, Jonathan here is to come and see, look and how British companies can help invest or train or support or export to, to Grand Bahama to try and make this the next great success story. Trade Commissioner Jonathan Knott sharing what his role and responsibilities are. My job um, in across Latin America and the Caribbean is to increase the flows of business. Um, after we left the EU, it's important for the UK to reach out to all of the countries of the world, and this is part of the reason um, Ms Ward and I are here today, is really to look at the opportunities for the UK and Bahamian companies to work together to achieve just that, to make our countries, um, uh, our, our countries' economies grow, um, to have our people, our populations also benefit from that exchange. Chamber President James Carey says he's delighted to have the team visit the island. I'm ecstatic that he says that Grand Bahama is the prize of the economy in the Bahamas um, because that is exactly what we think. And this is just uh, another step in our mission with the recovery of uh, Freeport and Grand Bahama. Uh, and we hope that some true benefits will come out of this. All right, great news. Well, Prime Minister Philip Davis in his budget communication saying that the time has come for decisive action as it relates to the Grand Bahama Port Authority. Well, that statement sending Rupert Hayward to the media announcing that his family will be selling 50% of their stake in the GBPA. And now the Minister of Foreign Affairs is calling on the GBPA to live up to their end of the Hawksville Creek Agreement. Megan Shepard reports. But who is responsible for investment, attracting investment to the city? Who is responsible for the infrastructure under the Hawksbill Creek Agreement? Member of Parliament for Fox Hill, Fred Mitchell, saying the Hawksbill Creek Agreement, signed in 1955, established a set of mutual agreements which involved the Grand Bahama Port Authority maintaining the city of Freeport, promoting investment, and building certain infrastructure projects. He says the government is to provide services to the city and the GBPA is to reimburse the government. But according to Mitchell, that has not been happening. There's a bill outstanding now on that matter. So it's not as if 
Yeah, but you know, I'm not sure I have permission to say any of that, but I'm just saying generally that that's the issue. Mitchell also noting a lingering fear on the island of Grand Bahama. The government has been carrying Freeport and the responsibilities of the Grand Bahama Port Authority yes. for at least 10 years, if not more. He questioned why Rupert Hayward would take his issues to the public, adding that the evidence is on the ground as it relates to the current state of the island. The Minister for Grand Bahama did a special program 2021. The government's resources put $9 million and to help clean up Freeport. Whose responsibility was it to clean up Freeport after the storm? The government or the Grand Bahama Port Authority? I mean, it seems clear as day. Mitchell calling it a minimalist argument. We're simply saying you have an agreement. It's called the Hawksbill Creek Agreement. All we're saying is, if that's the agreement, follow the agreement. Nothing more, nothing less. If you're supposed to be promoting investment in Freeport, then promote investment. If you're supposed to be putting infrastructure in Grand Bahama and supporting it, then put the infrastructure. Reporting for our news, I'm Megan Shepard. Thanks, Megan. Off and on showers in the capital today, and these weather conditions are expected to continue. Meteorologist Greg Thompson is in the Weather Center with a first look at weather. Greg. Yeah, thanks, Natalia, and welcome, everybody, for a quick check on conditions outside our studios and around the islands. Mostly cloudy outside our studios right now with some nearby showers and isolated thunderstorms. Temperatures, 83 degrees. Your winds are out of the south, lit on the breezy side at 13 miles per hour, and that's making it feel like 83. Satellite view, moisture plume continues across our area. Showers and thunderstorms across the central and southeast Palmas. Some possible flooding still expected across the area. We had a dry slot moving across the northwest Palmas, but we're now starting to see some showers and thunderstorms moving across us big batch to the west of Andros that will continue to track towards the north and east so we could see one or two more showers later on tonight through tomorrow that's your quick check on conditions around the island stick with us look at your extended forecast is still to come still to come in our news unrestored appeal hear why the court of appeal refused to restore an appeal of a doctor following medical malpractice accusations we have details from inside the courtroom and public opinion royal caribbean international is set to host a consultation meeting in the nation's capital this evening as widespread debate continues over its proposed beach club project and later hear how government is streamlining the process for disaster management that's all coming up when our news returns appeal has refused to restore doctor's appeal against a medical malpractice finding. In 2019, Justice Ian Winder found that Dr. Anthony Carey breached his duty of care to a patient whom he performed fibroid removal surgery on. During the procedure, an injury to the patient's adherent bowel were observed and repaired. Following the surgery, the patient developed complications. Justice Weiner found that the injury was caused by the procedure and was missed by Dr. Carey. Dr. Carey filed a notice to appeal against Justice Weiner's decision on May 13, 2019. However, the appeal was struck out after Carey's lawyers failed to settle the record and pay a bond. Now, on June 28, 2022, Carey filed a motion seeking to have the appeal restored. Rejecting the application, the court said Carey had not shown any good reason why his appeal should be restored years later after it had been struck out. The public will get to learn more about Royal Caribbean International's multi-million dollar beach club project during a special meeting that's being held tonight at Queen's College. The company issuing a statement indicating updates to the proposed development, which is expected to be discussed tonight. The 17-acre beach club will be made up of 13 acres of land owned by the cruise line and four acres of crown land. There was widespread opposition to RCI being granted the go-ahead for the project as some of the crown land was in dispute. Bahamian investor Toby Smith claimed it was already leased. Smith planned to build out his own beach club for locals and visitors.
Following Hurricane Dorian, several agencies were formed to help residents rebuild their lives with the assistance of government. But Director of the National Emergency Management Agency, Captain Stephen Roll, telling Rotarians this afternoon that government is looking to streamline agencies such as NEMA and the Disaster Reconstruction Authority. He says the Inter-American Development Bank was brought on board to assess operations. And the new Disaster Risk Management Act was developed and passed in Parliament this year. What that means, the act governing NEMA, the Disaster Preparedness and Response Act, which is passed in 2006, and the DRA Act, which is passed in 2019, they are both being repealed, squashed, cancelled. And this new act, the Disaster Risk Management Act, comes into play um, hopefully on the 1st of July with commencement of the new fiscal year. So as of the 1st of Ju July, NEMA no longer exists. And as for what will replace those vital agencies? We now should be forming a Disaster Risk Management Authority. Authority should become assumed as of the 1st of July. Okay, a new name, new banner. Um, most authorities are spearheaded by a manage, um, executive chairman and a managing director, etc., and a board of directors. That should all come to um, come to the surface hopefully during the course of this month, but definitely as we um, move forward. That is the government's desire this time, and we are busy trying to make this thing come to pass. It's now time for tonight's Financial Market Minute, brought to you by RF, your local investment bank. has been your Financial Market Minute. To explore the best performing mutual funds in the Bahamas, visit our website at www.rfgroup.com. NFL Fly Football is coming to the Bahamas and we catch up with one of the top Bahamian baseball prospects in the minors. Hold tight, our sports is coming right up. Light showers on this Thursday and there's some more rain in the forecast as the weekend is quickly approaching. Greg is back with your extended weather when our news returns. Today's sports update is sponsored by Michelob Ultra, distributed in the Bahamas by Jimmy's Wines and Spirits. This is our news. Welcome back. The NFL's flag football program is expanding to the Bahamas, and we caught up with a rising Major League Baseball prospect. Here's Tej Adderley with a check on sports. Tej? Thanks, Natalia. The NFL has ambitious plans to expand flag football to the Caribbean. The first stop, the beautiful shores of the Bahamas. Our Sasha Lightburn has more. Officials from the National Football League want to bring football to all corners of the globe, and they're doing just that, making the Bahamas the first country in the region where the NFL flag program will be launched. The official announcement came yesterday at a press conference at the National Stadium. NFL flag global ambassador and the first female international NFL coach Phoebe Schechter says they only hope to build on what the current flag football community has already established. We see the great infrastructure that you have here. We know that you're already playing flag football and not only are you only play, uh, playing, you guys have incredible athletes and you're competitive. We're here just to enhance that. And Schechter goes further adding that the young generation is the key to it all. You guys have what I've been referring to as sauce and that's what we want when it comes to NFL Flag Bahamas is you putting your culture on it. Um, I look at my experiences as an athlete, right? I, I started playing American football later in life and the way that as a female it has changed my life, it has empowered me and given me confidence and we want to give that back to your younger generation. Sports Minister Mario Boleg was also on hand for the official announcement. My ministry welcomes this partnership with the NFL and the local flag association here in the Bahamas. 
We look forward to the opportunities and exposure that this partnership will bring to our country and our young Bahamian athletes. Young men and women will have the opportunity to be seen and recruited by U.S. colleges. Now other events surrounding the launch will include school tours, public engagement activities and games at the Thomas A. Robinson Stadium, as well as a community roundtable featuring Bahamian government leaders, students, community advocates and others. Reporting for our sports, I'm Sasha Lightborn. Thanks, Sasha. I retired from flag football, but maybe you're still in the closet. I might have to come and show him something. Moving on to baseball, B.J. Murray continues his impressive double-A campaign. B.J. Murray continues to ball out for the Chicago Cubs double-A affiliate, the Tennessee Smokies. The 23-year-old switch hitting infielder is hitting 277 with seven home runs, 33 RBI, and a smoking hot 912 OPS, good for second in the league. He also led his team to a division best 30 and 23 record. Just last night, he helped his team to an 11-2 blowout over the Rocket City Trash Pandas, going two for five with a double and an RBI. The way he's been mashing the ball, don't be shocked if he ends the season on the north side's expanded roster. That's all for sports today. I'm Tay Adderley. We're almost at the end of the work week. Do you have any weekend plans? Well, Greg is back with your extended weather forecast when our news returns. Stay with us. Welcome back to our news. Calm weather conditions outside the R News studios this evening. Meteorologist Greg Thompson is back in the Weather Center to tell us if these conditions will continue for the rest of the work week. Greg? Yeah, thanks again, Italian. Welcome back, everybody, for our final check on weather. We still have that upper level trough in the Gulf of Mexico. A dip in the jet stream is really what it is. And that's uh, bringing quite a bit of moisture across the area out of the Caribbean. Big blow up to the south of Jamaica and eastern Cuba. That is moving across the central and southeast Palmas. And then we still have some showers and thunderstorms across central Cuba that's moving towards the area. And that will continue to be the trend throughout the rest of the week and into the weekend as this uh, upper level trough slowly moves towards the east. And uh, of course, that will continue continue to bring us uh, some wet conditions across the area. Satellite view and radar composite showing showers and thunderstorms across Florida and Cuba moving in our direction. And as I mentioned, showers and thunderstorms across the central and southeast Palmas prompting some severe thunderstorm warnings earlier today. Of course, flooding is the main concern with this as we expect anywhere from four to six inches with isolated amounts up to about eight to 10 inches. So do ask you down there in the central and southeast Palmas to stay vigilant as we expect some flooding to continue. Forecast map showing uh, that rather nice we got that slot across the northwest Palmas. Then we have some showers and thunderstorms. That will move through our area by Friday. And then big bullseye across New Providence and the Lutra. So we could see some heavy showers tomorrow. And then by Saturday, it starts to wane. But most of the activity drifting back into the central and southeast Bahamas. Boating forecast for the northwest and central Bahamas tonight to tomorrow. Your winds will be shifting south to southwest, picking up in speed. 15 to 20 knots. The sea is running 4 to 6 feet. So a small craft caution is in effect. Tide is present low will be high at 32 minutes past midnight. For the southeast Bahamas, caution flag for you guys down there as well. Southeast is suddenly flow at 15 knots. Seas will be running 3 to 5 feet over open waters. Here's a look now at your national forecast. In your extended forecast, the wet weather pattern will continue. It looks as though it will continue into the weekend, into the early portions of next week. We should see some isolated showers and thunderstorms by Saturday and Sunday. And by middle of next week, we expect conditions to be improving. That's a look at our weather. Make it a safe night, everybody. All right, thanks so much, Greg, and thank you for joining us for our news tonight. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Italia Hall. We'll see you tomorrow night. Have a great evening.